Thank you for the invitation and for giving me the chance to give a talk. It feels very weird to speak with a microphone. Um, okay, so, um, so uh, today I would like to talk about algebraic sums of uh, sets coming from beta expansions with unique expansions. But before I do that, uh, let me just say a few words about the history of uh, such a question. Um, actually, it's initiated in 87 with the Takens uh, Palace conjecture on their study of, on homoclinic points in dynamical systems, tangencies in dynamical systems. And they asked the question whether the sum of two counter sets is either, has either measure zero or contains an interval. And of course, this, uh, the question is not true in general. And there are many people that worked on this question, including Boris Solomiak. And, uh, <laughs> and in 2000, actually, um, four, uh, three mathematicians, Cabrelli, Hare, and Molter, gave an answer, not a complete answer. They gave a bound on how much you can remove in order to get an interval, which is a natural thing. But all the answers of such a question relies on um, a gap theorem due to Newhaus and actually generalized by Estelle. So I would like to start with that, and then I can go to the sets that I'm interested in. And the sets I'm interested in, they're not really counter sets because they're not closed, but they're almost counter sets. OK, so let me start with, uh, with the notion of a thickness of a counter set. And for that, I'm going to say something maybe you all know. So let me start with a generalized counter set. Uh, so this is just a set. Oops. Okay, I'll put it back. Okay, so this is a set, let me call it C. And this is just a closed interval I. Uh, and I'm going to remove from it a countable union of disjoint open intervals. So these are disjoint open intervals in I. OK, I'm saying counter set, and usually counter set, there is an inductive method of defining it, which people call the counter dissection method. And you can do that here. And this is done with the help of what people call derivation. So you define a binary tree that tells you at each stage which interval to remove. And the derivation is not unique. So let me uh, tell you how to do it. A general way of doing it is as follows. So first, uh, you start with the interval i. And if you like, you, this is uh, coded with the empty word. And then uh, from i, I pick uh, O1. So this is the open interval with the least index. And I remove O1 from i. So I get two intervals. Let me call them i0 and i1. And in fact, i is the union of i0, O1, and i1. And because these are disjoint open intervals, the rest of the intervals are in these two. And then suppose I did it at stage n. So I have a bunch of intervals here coded by binary words of length n, let's say. So let's say I have here an i omega or w. And so in, I find the least, uh, the o with the least index that lies in here. So I write i omega as the O with the least index. Let me call it i omega. And a union of two closed intervals, i omega 0 and omega 1. And that will be the branched ones in here. And I continue like this. And I get a tree, which I call D. And this is called derivation of the Cantor set a derivation, because there might be more. 
Okay, once I have a derivation, I can define the thickness of a counter set. And I do it like this. First, you do it per derivation. So what you do is at each stage of this tree, so if I'm at this node, I compare what I, what's left with what I have removed. So I look at the length of i omega 0 compared to uh, the interval I removed. Uh, my notation is a bit inconsistent, but uh, it's okay. I take the minimum of these two, and then I look at the inf over all possible words in the derivation. And um, so this is the th thickness uh, with respect to this derivation. And then the thickness of the counter set uh, C is just the supremum over, of tau D of C over all possible derivations. And the new house Astell, because Astell later he sort of generalized what or improved what Newhouse did. So let me mention, and I'm not going to mention it in full generality, I'm just going to write a simplified version that I will be using. So it says that if tau of c is bigger or equal to one, so if the counter set is thick enough, then for any lambda, not zero. If I, if I add C to a translate of C, then it contains an interval. Which is a natural thing, so if you want an interval, you cannot be removing a lot. Is it true that if you take the interval by descending length, you can avoid the taking supremum over derivation? Yeah, yeah, that's what I would be doing, actually. Oh. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let me move this up. And this down. Okay. So let me now come to the sets that I'm interested in. So I'm going to look at beta between one and two. And we know that every x in the interval zero, one over beta minus one, but I will be working on zero, one today, but let me just mention it, uh, can be written as an infinite sum of the, form, of the form ai over beta to the i, i one to infinity with ai in zero, one. And the point is when beta is not an integer, we have typically uncountably many representations of this form. Which I call beta expansion. In fact, before the golden mean, if beta is less than or equal to the golden mean, um, except for once, let me make it like this. Uh, we have every point has uncountably many expansions. Um, and after the golden mean, I'm avoiding the golden mean because one uh, for the golden mean has countably many, so let me just do it like this. Uh, this happens on a set of measure ones. Was, uh, yeah, so this happens on a set of measure one. Which means there are exceptional sets, there are sets of points with a unique expansion, k expansions with k finite, or countably many. So, uh, so the exceptional sets might not be empty, and usually they're not. And they have been studied in the last 10 years quite extensively, the topological structure of such exceptional sets, and also Hauser dimension, and all sorts of questions were really heavily investigated. And today I want to look at the following um, exceptional set. So I'm going to fix x in zero one, just because our proofs work for this. And, uh, so the results might be true also bigger than one, but I will concentrate on that today. Yeah? Are you saying that the set of 
x for which that happens has measure one? Yeah. But the interval is bigger than one, so it's confusing. A normalized Lebesgue measure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll look at the set ux, uh, which is the set of all bases, beta. Actually, I can include two, for which x has a unique beta expansion. Okay, uh, the topological structure of this set was studied by uh, Komornik and Dufries, and one thing uh, that I would like to mention is that this is not necessarily closed. In fact, it's almost closed in the sense that if I look at the closure of u minus u, this is at most countable. Okay, and uh, so this is the free, uh, maybe come on, you can freeze. Okay, and recently, in 2014, I don't remember when this was done, I think 2010, but I'm not sure. Uh, 2014, uh, Lu, uh, Tan, and Wu uh, showed that the Lebesgue measure of U is zero, so it has no interior. But it's big in the Hausdorff dimension, and that the Hausdorff dimension of U is equal to one. So today I'm going to concentrate on this set, and I'm going to show this result, that if I take any lambda not equal to zero, and uh, we add U to a translator of itself, then it contains an interval. And, uh, uh, let me mention people that I worked with. So I'll move this up. Oh, no, this up. Sorry, is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so um, actually, I would like to do two theorems today, but depending on the time. So I'll start with this one. So this is by myself, Kong, uh, Komornik, Komornik. I want to write things in alphabetical order. Diron Kong. And Wing Shali, we, we proved the following that what I just mentioned that for every lambda, actually two parts, for every lambda not zero, if I add u to a translate of itself, this contains an interval. And the second one, which looks fancy, but it's really the same as this, namely for every lambda not zero. If I look at the algebraic product of u with u to the power lambda, then this also contains an interval. Okay, this is not surprising too because you take logarithms, you translate it to the question one. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Um, yeah, using the gap theorem. But first, of course, and uh, so I, um, okay, so the idea is, let me just write the idea is to find a counter set inside ux of sufficiently big thickness. Thickness greater than or equal to one. I get the result for this counter set, and of course it will hold for you. Okay, so how are we going to get this? First, I have to go to the symbolic world. So I'm going to have a symbolic representation of u, or ux. And this is done with the help of the quasi-greedy expansion. So let me just remind you of this. So the first thing is uh, find a symbolic representation of ux uh, via 
the quasi greedy expansion. Okay, um, as I mentioned, typically points have uncountably many expansions, and if you order them in the lexicographical ordering, then the quasi greedy expansion is the largest in the lexicographical order, infinite, so I don't want it, want it to end in zeros, and you can fix this quite easily by removing, uh, making the last digit, if it's finite, you make the last digit one less, and then you repeat this block periodically, so not ending with zeros. So it's the largest infinite beta expansion. Okay, um, so let me, and why do we want that? Because the quasi-greedy expansion, that's also work of Komornik and Lerati, um, you can characterize if you have a, a unique expansion with the help of the quasi-greedy, so maybe I will uh, write it down here. I'll just move this a little bit up. So let me mention characterization of unique expansion. Um, the idea is the following. So suppose uh, delta i is the quasi-greedy expansion of one. And uh, let's say a i and uh, a beta expansion of x. Um, if you have the following, so you're going to compare a i to delta i. So if, and you do it at every digit, so if a n is zero, uh, and if it happens that uh, the tail, a n plus one, a n plus two, etc., is less than in the lexicographical ordering, less than or equal, less than uh, the delta i. Uh, so if you have this situation, and then a, if a n is one, then you flip these. You flip the zeros to ones and the ones to zeros is less than delta i. So if you have if you have a sequence a i satisfying this property then AI is, the, is a unique expansion, is a unique beta expansion of X. So this is a very handy characterization, and it's going to tell us which bases are in U. Okay, so once we have this, now let's go to the symbolic uh, thing right here. Okay, so X is fixed, of course. And I'm going to define a map Vx that's going to go from the bases to the symbolic world by simply what uh, you expect me to write. Namely, I'm going to take a base and I'm going to send it to the quasi-greedy expansion of X. One nice property of this map is that it's strictly increasing. And this is not hard to convince yourself because the base is appearing in the denominator. If you increase the base, then you have to increase your numerator in order to achieve the same point. So you get a bigger sequence. And in particular, I'm going to restrict, uh, if I uh, look at the image of ux under phi, I'm going, uh, yeah, I'm going to do double line here for the image. Then I get a symbolic copy of ux in, in the symbolic world, and this is a bijection. So phi 
x when I restrict it to u with range the w, <laughs> this one, this is a strictly increasing bijection. Okay, so I can now work in the two worlds, in the real world and in the symbolic world. And the symbolic world is good for me because it allows me to do this derivation, yeah, to define a counter set. Okay. Okay, so now um, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to find the counter set. And in fact, um, Lu, where, is it? where are they? Up there. Lu, Tan, and Wu. In fact, they, uh, they gave us the counter set, but of course they were busy with other things. Uh, and we derived other uh, properties from their theorem. We could derive other things. Uh, but I will not mention them here because they go in the technical details of the proof and I don't want to mention technical details. So let me tell you their theorem. And I really like it a lot because it tells you basically from the binary expansion, if you take the first part of the binary expansion and you do something in the tail, then you can transform the binary expansion to a unique quasi-greedy expansion. So this is new tan and wu with a bit modification uh, on our part, but let me just refer to them now. Okay, so again, x is fixed. And I look at phi x of two, which means I look at the quasi-greedy expansion of x in base two. Of course, we have a unique expansion, except if you are a dyadic rational, then you end up with zeros or with ones. So I do the one. Yeah, so this is, uh, let me call it a i, uh, x i. So this is the, I use the fancy terminology, quasi uh, greedy binary expansion. Okay, so ending with a tail of one in case it ends with zeros. Okay, um, then there exists an m uh, greater than zero. This is how much, definitely how much you're going to take from the binary expansion, the first m blocks, but more. Then there exists an m and a sequence of integers. Let me call them n j, uh, starting from three, and a sequence n j. Um, such that, okay, I want to guarantee that at the m plus nj position of the binary expansion, I see a one, which I can do because I, I have infinitely many ones. Uh, and this set, which I call, I'm in the symbolic words, so I'll do double lines, I call it uj. which is the set of sequences that begin exactly the same as the binary expansion of x up to level m plus n, j. Here I have a one. And then I put a, a tail of zeros and one, but they are, there's some restriction. I want to guarantee that this starts in a zero. Uh, so the epsilon i's are zeros or ones. And in here, I see at most nj minus one consecutive blocks of zeros, and also n, at most nj minus one consecutive blocks of ones. So epsilon n plus one up to epsilon n plus nj, that this is not in zero to the nj, one to the nj. So I look at this set, and what they showed, and I'll give you a few hints, that this is in U of X. So these sequences give me unique quasi-greedy expansion of X. And the idea, of course, you take the sequence, you, uh, right here, 
it needs some work, but let me just give you the, uh, the skeleton of how to do this. So of course you do x is equal to sigma whatever is there. So let me just write like this one over beta plus blah, blah, blah. So I take such a sequence which begins like this and then I have the epsilons. And, and I, so here beta is unknown. So of course, so I find the beta, beta that solves this equation. And then you uh, find the, actually you don't, but uh, let me just write it like this. Find the quasi greedy expansion of one with this base. And then we show that this sequence with the quasi greedy satisfies star. Uh, so let me call this delta i, and uh, so, and then show that the, the x1 up to blah, blah, xm plus nj, and then the epsilons uh, and uh, satisfy star. Okay, so, uh, so with these uj's, um, so we found a symbolic copy of uh, a Cantor set inside UJ, uh, UX, and um, what did I want to say? No, infinite, infinite. Sorry. Yeah, they're infinite, uh, and they are nested, right? Uh, U1 is in U2 is in U3, and you can see that the higher the J the less the restriction because the blocks that you're allowing of zeros and ones are getting bigger and bigger, so you're making less and less restrictions. And you can see that the thickness is getting bigger and bigger as j goes to infinity. So you just put a restriction on the first letters out to m plus nj, and then you have the freedom. Yeah, freedom, but there is this, uh, of course, that I, I don't want to see more than nj zeros, consecutive zero. Yeah, yes. exactly. As I said, we deduced a little bit more about these sequences, which were important for the technical proof, but I'll stop here on, on this. Okay, so great. So now I have uh, this uj in the symbolic word, and of course I can look at its image under phi in order to see it in the real world. Um, so let me do here, over there. Oh no, I use both words. So let's see, phi is going from the real, okay. So now I look at uh, uj with a curly u here, x, and this is the, in, uh, the image, but now I go inverse because my uj's were sitting in the symbolic word of the uj. And these will be my cantor sets, so I have to tell you, I have to show you that they are cantor sets. So I have to do this derivation, which is also important to define the thickness. Okay, now the derivation in the general procedure that I described here, because I was doing it in general, oh yeah, I started with the empty word and I did uh, this binary construction. But of course, this is not a unique way. So for us, our binary tree will be indexed by the following, by words coming from the following set. So I'm going to look at omega j of x, which is the set of beginning words in uj. But I want to make sure that these words are long enough that I'm sitting in the epsilons part. So n is bigger than m plus nj. Um, and, uh, and that they are the beginning words. And that is epsilon one, epsilon two, this is zero, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, satisfying this, uh, let me write it, such that omega one up to omega n, epsilon one, epsilon two, blah, 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 is a new chip. So implicitly I'm saying, uh, I'm telling you that there is also a restriction on the epsilons. 
Okay, so these are the binary words that I'm going to use in the tree. Okay, because I am n is bigger than m plus nj, this means every word here ends with either 0, 1 to the k or 1, 0 to the k with k less than nj. Yeah, so each omega 1 up to omega n in omega j ends in 0, 1 to the k with k less than or equal to nj minus 1 or 1, 0 to the k with the same thing. Okay, great. And now I'm going in the symbolic world still. I'm going to tell you what these intervals will look like. And then I will transform them to the real world. Uh, I think I can do this. Okay, so um, I'm, for each uh, omega 1 up to omega n in, uh, let me call it just omega for simplicity, so this is a word of length n in omega j, I'm going to look at, you know, in the derivation there are intervals, these i's, so now I'm going to look at the symbolic version of them. So let i omega be the smallest lexicographical interval containing omega and we can write it explicitly. So for example, if omega ends in, uh, let me start with the uh, 1, 0 to the k, then i omega, it's uh, be the smallest closed. Um, okay, it's not hard to find, uh, to find what it is. I, I, the left end point must be the smallest uh, infinite word containing this. So I have a k, and I can have at most nj minus 1 uh, zeros. So this will be my omega, which ends in this. I can put the rest of the zeros I can put. So it will be nj minus 1 minus k. And then I make my tail as small as possible. So I do 0 to the nj, uh, sorry, uh, 1, and then 0 to the nj minus 1 repeated. So this is my left end point. And my right end point would be omega. And then I put as, as many ones as I can. So nj minus 1. And then 0. So I do like this. So this is uh, the, close, the smallest closed lexicographical, lexicographical interval containing this. And of course, the same thing for 0, 1 to the k. Then here I keep omega and I put the as many zeros as I want, as I can, actually. And here I want to make it the largest, so I put the rest of the ones that I'm allowed. And then as big as possible. Yeah. I like this. Okay. Uh, and in fact, uh, uj itself, I can also find the smallest closed interval containing it, because any word here has this beginning, right? It begins like this, and then I have a 1 and a 0. That is guaranteed, actually like this. So 
uh, let me just write it, the smallest lexicographical interval, closed interval, containing uj in the symbolic word is uh, the interval i, and then here I have x1 up to xm plus nj, and then a zero, and this is actually a one. And this is my starting interval in the dissection method. Okay. Um, yeah, so now let's do this dissection, which would be kind of not hard to see. So let me move the first. This was the first one. the second one, let's see if it's we this one then. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now let's do the derivation uh, in the symbolic world. Uh, symbolic derivation. <laughs> okay, um, good. So my starting interval is this uh, i that I mentioned here, the i x1, blah, blah, blah. And if, let's say, uh, at, at level n, and one of my intervals in this dissection method is i omega, one of the intervals. And um, okay, so now I'm going to tell you how it's split. Of course, it depends on how omega ends. So if omega ends in uh, one zero to the nj minus one, so if I have really all the zeros that I can put, then I cannot put any more zeros. This means that if I adjoin a zero to omega, then I'm not in my omega j. And in this case, going from level n to level n plus one, I just set i omega equals i omega one. So this will be seen. This is the level n uh, thing, and level n plus one, I just don't do anything. So just there's no splitting. And I start with the trivial cases. And if omega ends in 0, 1, uh, 0, 1, and j minus 1, then I don't, cannot put any more 1s. And again, there is no splitting. And at level n plus 1, i omega will be read i omega 0, because I have to put a 0. And in all other cases, there is splitting. So let's just write otherwise if you still have room to put zeros or to put one, then there is splitting. And I'm going to call a g omega as i omega minus i omega zero union i omega one. And this is not empty. So this is the open interval I'm going to remove. So at level and it was here, and at level n plus one, I have i omega one, zero, and i omega one. Yeah. And but this is in the symbolic world, and of course you can move to the real world with this phi. So now let me just uh, do some notation. So I'm gonna call i omega as phi x inverse i omega and g omega as the x inverse 
of the G omega. And for the thickness, I need to compare the gap with what I remove to the bridges, what, what remains. Actually, I should have said this. The, usually the terminology is what you remove is called a gap and what you leave is bridge. Uh, so I will only look at words for which the G is not uh, empty. So let me just write this with a star. So this is all omega in omega J, such that G omega is not empty. So when I do have a splitting. And this will occur. Even at this point, I didn't split, but in the follow, following step, I might split. Yeah. OK. And um, these, actually, we know that we can describe very well, because we know the endpoints of i omega. And so we can, of course, these are real intervals. So it's, I don't know, I call them PQ. These are real numbers or the bases. But I know they're quasi-greedy expansion, so I have, and I, the map is increasing, so I have a lot of control. OK, so I don't want to do any technical details now. I just want to write down that if j is sufficiently large, that is, if I am putting less and less restrictions on my sequence, which means I'm removing less and less, then the gap compared to the bridge is relatively small. So I'll just write down here that we show that for j sufficiently large, uh, the length of the gap in the real world is less than the length of i omega 0, and also the same thing here. And this means that in the definition there, uh, the tau, the d for me is the, this omega j. And this will tell me that the thickness with respect to this derivation, omega star, is bigger or equal to 1. I don't even need to do supremo. And then I can use the Newhouse Estelle theorem that tells me that uh, exactly that ux plus lambda ux contains an interval. And for the second part, with the product, you just take logarithms, and it's exactly the same proof, really. OK, so let me, in the remaining part, talk another about uh, the proof is the same, but I will talk about another set. But this one is not coming from beta expansions, but coming from what we call symmetric binary expansions. So let me tell you what it is. Okay, so. Okay, so um Actually, last year, together with Charlene Keller, we looked at the following question. The question is quite easy to describe. So for each alpha between 1 and 2, I'm, I'm going to define a parameterized family of binary, symmetric binary maps, defined as follows. I'm going to define S alpha from minus 1, 1 to itself. by uh, S alpha of x is 2x minus uh, alpha if x is between half and 1. OK, to make it open. Yeah, there is an ambiguity in the half and minus half. That's where the discontinuities are. I write it like this now, but of course, you can put a half in here.
So this family is quite easy to describe. So here I have the 2x, and here I have the 2x minus alpha, and here I have the 2x plus alpha. So this one, the middle one is fixed, but the, the left and the right, they move with alpha. So if alpha is a, is a 1, then uh, this line is completely up here, and this line is completely down here, and you just get two copies of the binary map. And if alpha is a 2, then uh, this will go down and this will go up. And as you slide, this thing uh, yeah, goes up and down, but in opposite directions. And um, we were interested uh, um, in the following question, because it's related to the smoothness of the density function, of the invariant density. Um, at half and at minus half, we have discontinuities. But of course, the behavior is completely symmetric. So whatever I say about half is the same for minus half. And half goes to, depending on which map you use, here I made a choice. But in fact, half can go to 1 if I use the 2x, or it can go to uh, 1 minus alpha. And uh, the dynamic of, of this thing really depends on, on the orbits of a half or on the orbits of these two points and the symmetric one, the minus, uh, as well as the density. All kinds of questions are like the beta expansions. Everything is related to one. All the dynamic is described with the expansion of one, and here with the expansion of these two things. And uh, for reasons of densities and smoothness, we were interested in when do these uh, two orbits ma uh, merge? That is, uh, there is an n for which Tn of uh, S alpha n of 1 equals Sn alpha of 1 minus alpha, because then the density becomes a finite sum, and we can say a lot. So we looked at what we call the matching index, m alpha. So this is the inf, or minimum. Uh, n greater or equal, maybe I should do n because it might not exist, uh, greater or 1 such that s alpha n of 1 equals s n alpha of 1 minus alpha. So these are the possible images of one, uh, half. And we showed that m alpha is finite, the bag almost everywhere for almost all choices of parameters, and uh, we looked at the exceptional set n. So this is the set of alphas for which m alpha is infinity. And this has the same properties as the ux. This has Lebesgue measure 0, of course, from up. It's totally disconnected. It doesn't have, it is not a Cantor set because it has isolated points, but it's almost. And it has a house of dimension one. Okay, so it has very similar properties to UX, and you can ask the same question. Is, uh, 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 for every lambda not zero, we are interested in whether n plus a scale copy of n contains an interval. And the answer is, again, yes. And the proof is almost the same. The only difference is we have to find the appropriate symbolic version. And this happens as follows. When do I stop? OK, great. So the first thing I need to do is the symbolic representation. In the greedy, uh, we used it, oh, when we were doing beta expansions, we had the quasi-greedy expansion uh, at our disposal. And now um, I have to mention a result also. Move this up and this down. This seems the second here. Yeah.
So in our proof that you have matching or M alpha is finite almost everywhere, the proof relied on the following uh, fact, or yeah, we proved it. So let me tell you what it is, because it supplies our symbolic uh, representation. So we have, uh, so I'm going to call D the doubling map, just to x modulo 1. And let me write it as a lemma. So this was part of this proof that says alpha, the following are equivalent. The first one is that alpha is an n. And the second one is that uh, when I look at 1 over alpha, uh, alpha is between 1 and 2. My parameter is between 1 and 2, so 1 over alpha is between a half and a 1. So it lives in the unit interval. So alpha and n is equivalent to saying that the orbit of 1 over alpha, the binary orbit uh, under the doubling map, avoids the interval 1 over 2 alpha, 1 minus 1 over 2 alpha for all n. So we have this characterization, which, is, which was really neat, because uh, there was alpha was a parameter for the matching. One is fixed, and I'm looking at the variation of parameters to, to do this. And this is, a, 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 for ergodic theory, this is not good, because I'm looking at a specific orbit, and I cannot say whether things happen or not. I can only say generically. But here, this is a generic behavior, so I'm looking at uh, yeah, a point in my unit interval for, for which the binary map avoids a certain interval. And you can see that this has to happen with a measure um, zero, for example. Yeah? And uh, if you take this, you can also translate it into a symbolic uh, statement that says that if AI is the binary expansion of 1 over alpha, then this uh, 2 is equivalent to saying the following. Uh, and AI satisfies, or uh, no, OK, then AI satisfies, move this up, this one's the, mm, let's see, no. Yeah. OK, so I'm avoiding this interval. This means if I happen to be in the zero region, I have to be to the left of an one, 1 over 2 alpha. So my map does 2 times the point. So this is the same thing that if a n is 0, then I have to multiply by 2 to get the remaining part. And, and the remaining part will be less than 1 over alpha. So this a n plus 1, a n plus 2, etc is smaller in lexical graphical ordering than the A1, the, A uh, the whole sequence. And if I am in the 1 region, then I have to be the, to the right of 1 minus 1 over 2 alpha, which means I do 2x minus 1. And this is equivalent to saying that, that my tail is bigger than the flipped one. So you can see I have uh, not the same characterization as quasi-greedy, but it's something similar. OK, and I'm, then the, the rest is almost the same. So I'm going to use this to define my sets and j instead of uj. But now I have to tell you what this and j look like. Um, but first, I have to uh, get this map from the real world to the um, symbolic world. Let me call this condition star. Um, so I'm going to look at n. These are not the natural numbers, but just the symbolic version of n. Uh, all sequences AI. 
such that AI satisfies star. And I'm going to define C from M to my non um, matching uh, uh, parameters by. Um, yeah, you can see what I'm going to do. I'm going to take alpha or the other way around, the inverse, but basically I take alpha, I go to one over alpha, and I get its binary expansion. <coughs> so C of a sequence AI, I want to get an alpha out of it, so this is like the one over alpha, so I do one over, I evaluate this sequence in base two. So this is just the evaluation base two. So this gives me the alpha. And this gives me uh, two worlds now to work with. And inside n, I'm going to find a similar thing as the uj. So let me write it here. So now my nj in the symbolic world is going to be all sequences with the following property. Okay, uh, I have a J here, so I'm going to begin with uh, uh, let me write it the other way. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to log write a lot. So I have sequences that begin with one uh, J consecutive ones, and I have a tail like this: absolute one, absolute two, blah blah blah, such that in this tail, I have to begin in zero. And in this tail, I see at most j minus 1 consecutive zeros or consecutive ones. Now, it's not hard to verify that any sequence here satisfies the star. So this is actually a subset of this n, the image of my non-matching uh, uh, parameters. And then the rest of the proof is almost the same. So uh, we do some derivation and we show that if j is large enough, then the gap relative to the bridge is small and you get a counter set of thickness greater or equal to 1 and you get the result for the nj, and then you move back to n. So I think I'll end up here. Thank you very much.